Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, live with a loose lilac watercolor tutorial. Um, I am flying solo today because it's kind of a surprise um, like live stream. I didn't really plan it too well, uh, not too well, but I don't have Sarah here to uh, ask questions for me. So if you guys can see and hear me or actually see my little sketch here and hear me, would you please type it in the chat so I know I'm not talking to a wall and everything's going all right. Um, if you have a question for me, uh, the moderators, I have quite a few awesome moderators. I have Grace, I have Valerie, I have Joe. Um, there might be a few others that haven't popped in and said hello yet, uh, but they will answer questions that they know um, but otherwise just be patient because I'm gonna glance up at the uh, chat now and again to um, answer questions I'll probably take a lot of them at the end so that way folks in the replay um, can see the tutorial first and then hang out for the questions later so oh good everything's working great awesome okay I feel like I have to adjust my chair <laughs> I'm sitting too low okay Oh, this is so weird doing this by myself. I haven't done this for a while. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'll tell you what colors we're using. I'm going to use burnt sienna, which is kind of a warm brown. I am using um, olive green. and I'm using my Lucas paints. The olive green and Lucas looks an awful lot like sap green. So use whatever you have. There, It doesn't matter. You can interchange them. Um, I'm using Indithrone blue. If you don't have that, you could use Oppression blue. Um, I'm using Dioxazine violet, which is really, really strong. And I usually kind of overdo it with the purple when I paint lilacs when I use that color. But we're going to do some wet and wet washes. So hopefully we'll avoid that. And... Um, we have um this is actually called purple in the lucas line it's a pv19 color which you know can range from um you know saturated cool reds all the way to violets this kind of looks like a permanent mauve so if you have permanent mauve that's a, like in windsor and newton that's a perfect um substitute i have um this is permanent yellow light which is kind of like a lemony yellow it's a little stronger than a lemon but that kind of tone and i have a cobalt teal which is a beautiful almost ball jar blue color so i thought with a mason jar with lilacs and it would be a great um, a great color to use. So what we're going to do first is a couple lines, easy lines. I want this to remain fairly loose. So what I'm going to do is just, and I'm centering it up, which is kind of, usually you don't want to center things right on your paper, but with this lilac base, I'm going to have like leaves and flowers just kind of spilling over. So I am centering the jar. And I am basically just going to put two vertical lines for the sides of the jar. And I'm going to do one horizontal line, just kind of curve it a little bit, though. Bring it up to those verticals. Look at it upside down to make sure it is actually not leaning to the left or the right, because I tend to make crooked jars. And actually, I think I'll just kind of round this over at the top, too, so I kind of have like a rounded rectangle. And then I'm not really going to paint the flower or draw the flowers on, but I want to sketch on a few leaves because the leaves, the flowers are very, when you have, and this is really light, I'm going to tip it. I think you can see it a little bit better if I tip it. It's just a rounded rectangle. Um, and for, I just want to put a few leaves in there because um, lilac flowers, they're a multi-headed flower. They have a lot of um, loose, fluffy um uh petals and little kind of like little flowers in a big bunch basically kind of that's like a hydrangea or any of those flowers that are kind of like that so i don't want to have like a defined drawing of them i just want to get those hard edges those um those leaves in there you can draw a few stems in the base i actually don't think you really need to but i just want to make sure that i have some leaf leaf areas kind of protected and and saved out so i kind of know where i'm working all right and always it always helps to kind of tilt your work look at it at a different angle make sure that you have um that you don't have anything too crooked this line looks a little crooked to me i'm just gonna fatten it up at the top a little bit and when i need to erase on my watercolor paper i just use a soft plastic eraser these can be found um at any office supply store art supply store or even at the dollar store a lot of the time they usually come in like six packs at the dollar store and they're, they're they're all pretty much the same thing so you don't need to spend a lot of money they're not very expensive anyway all right so just erase anything that doesn't quite look right you just want a basic guide there 
and you don't want to rub too hard. And um, if I was drawing something really detailed, I wouldn't draw it on my watercolor paper. I draw it on like copy paper or, or tracing paper, and then I would transfer it on or trace it using my light box. Okay, so the other thing that's going to help keep us loose here is using a flat brush. And this is the Mimics that I'm always talking about. It's from that value set that I always recommend. I didn't get a chance to link up products um, in the video description, but I'll do that as soon as like the stream goes off the air. Um, I just, uh, I just didn't, this was kind of really, honestly, I like popped into my frugal crafter moderator group on Facebook. Um, and then I said, Hey, is anybody going to be around if I want to go live? And uh, Joe and Val and Grace popped in and I'm like, okay, cool. I know you guys got this. So, um, oh, for much wants to know what super chat is. That's something that YouTube just, um, uh, kind of put out there for creators. If somebody wanted to like make a pledge to somebody that was live, they could, and their name will show up with like their comment will be pinned to the top of the screen, like with a, like a red box around it, um, for like a certain amount of time. I can see it's probably really advantageous to like people to get like thousands of people chatting and you can't even like, you can't even see what they're saying. So I can see how that would be advantageous, but, um, that's just a way for people to donate to the creators if they want to. Um, all right, so I just want to make sure my paper is uniformly wet. I tip it to the light because that helps me see any spots that I might have missed. And I think I have got pretty much everything. All right, so now we're going to use some of those colors. And I like to try to integrate as many colors as I can in the background just because it, um, it helps unify the piece so i'm grabbing some of this permanent yellow light i like to add that like almost as i love to have like mason jars full of lilacs on my windowsill um when they're in bloom they just smell so pretty and i just love you know to look out the window and see the trees starting to come into bloom and see that beautiful um those beautiful purple flowers so i'm gonna get a little bit of yellow kind of like sunshine get some in the vase too because that's it always reflects and refracts around I'm going to pretend this is on a windowsill. I think I'll throw in a little bit of the um, olive green or sap green. It's funny. Lucas and Sennelier, I love their olive greens. They're as vivid as a sap green. A lot of other olive greens are a little bit dull. So, um, you know, use what you like. It doesn't have to be the same brand I'm using. A little bit of that in there. I haven't used this palette in a long time, and somebody had uh, purchased it, and they they uh, when I last time I used it, and uh, asked me if I could show it off again. And I'm like, oh yeah, I like that paint white. So it's been downstairs, and I've been working up here. That's probably why. Okay, yes, I'm using 140 pound cold press arches. I'm gonna grab um, some of this beautiful cobalt teal, and throw that right in the jar. See how using a big flat brush? This is like probably three quarter to one inch, three quarter inch flat. Um, it just keeps you a little looser. And um, I also like to throw some of that color down here on this windowsill area because um, when you have strong light shining through glass, it color glass, it will like send it across like the surface. So instead of getting a shadow, you actually get a reflection. I'm gonna grab a little bit of the burnt sienna Throw that in too. And I think I'm gonna take a little burnt sienna, add it with some indithrone blue. Uh, it's almost like an indigo color, actually. Um, it's very close to an indigo, but it's a single pigment color, so I prefer to use it to an indigo just because I know I, I feel like I'm gonna get a more um, robust, vibrant color because I don't have to consult concern myself with the other pigments that are used in indigo. I know I'm getting like a single pigment color. I feel like I want a little more brown in there. And when you're doing something like this, like I I don't have lilac trees. We tried to grow them once and they never grew. And I'm, I'm a little too, like, I, I won't just go into somebody's yard on somebody's property and cut lilacs. You know, I have to get permission. I'm just, I don't know. It makes me, <laughs> it just makes me feel weird. Um, so I'm kind of like being very impressionistic with this. Um, I do plan on probably doing more lilacs. My mother has a big lilac tree in her yard, and I'd love to go and just get some to, to paint. Now I'm going to take some of the uh, cobalt teal. And I'm mixing it in with a little bit of dioxazine violet. And this is going to give me a very kind of weak purple color. And I'm going to add that. You know, sometimes you get those lilacs that are more like almost um, very, very pale, almost like gray violet color. That's kind of what I want to go for here. And I'm just trying to avoid my leaves because um, I don't want them to get too muddy. If I had a lot of purple and I tried to paint the green leaves on top, they would just get real muddy because they're kind of the, the red and the purple is going to negate the green and just 
make it kind of yuck. So now I'm going to take some of the, um, they call it purple and Lucas, but it looks more like a permanent mauve to me. And I'm going to grab some of that, a little touch of dioxazine violet because it's so strong. I just want to get a little smidgen of it. And I am going to just kind of tap on some other shapes. I want to get those more violet lilacs. So when you're doing this, even though we're just kind of like putting in a wash to establish our colors, you want to think about putting them in kind of in that um, spiky shape that they come in. They're kind of like... Um, like these um well kind of like spikes or triangles so that's what i want to get in here and I, I just find using a flat i usually use round brushes so i'm like i just i get so like i overwork my lilacs a lot so i'm like if i do this then i'm just going to be able to stay a lot freer and looser with them there i just love how the pigments kind of separate that i've mixed together and give me a interesting look i'm going to give a little bit of that in the vase as well because every color will be affected and re reflected affected and reflected and refracted in, in our glass a little bit in the countertop too or the that could be a counter i think it's a windowsill there oh i like it okay so now let's take a little bit of um of the sap green olive green color by the way i haven't really been paying attention to the chat so um if you do think of a question write it down because i know it can get really easy to forget what you're thinking of as you are um as like the tutorial goes so if you have a question write it down i'll ask for questions at the end because i really don't think i'm going to catch them as they go by unless you don't mind if one of the moderators answers and they can you could definitely um ask them in the chat uh i don't know how much i want to do with those leaves right now just because they're going to get mushed out. So what I think I'm going to do is kind of wipe off my brush and just maybe hit the edges just so they don't bleed out too much. And I will be drying this in just a second. So actually, if you do have any questions, I will take some questions in a second while my heat gun is going because I can I can read and um, and it, and uh, run my hair dryer at the same time. <laughs> I'm just pulling a little some stem color there. All right, I'm really liking this wash. I'm going to tip it though before I dry it, just so you can see uh, wet how it looks. Because sometimes I do have some pretty strong lights in here, so there you can kind of see. Um, I have it. I don't know. It's. I think it's. It looks. It's a little darker than what it looks like on my monitor. So um, it's not super dark though. I wanted it to be pretty light and airy. So if anybody, oh yes, there are Sharon, there are birds. My and my door open and, and I put for feeders out this year for the first time and I have all kinds of birds and squirrels. It's really cool. And I like to use the, uh, the heat gun here um, just to, so I don't have to kind of wait and then end up with fuzzy edges because I got impatient. All right, White Wave asks, why do you use acrylic paint brushes for watercolor painting? Um, you can use acrylic paint brushes like this Royal Majestic can be used for acrylics or for watercolors. But generally, I use these Mimics. And um, I wouldn't recommend these for acrylics. I don't think they have the body and the bristles to push the acrylic paint around. I think you'd be really disappointed and you wouldn't be able to get very good detail with them. Uh, generally, with watercolor, you want a very absorbent brush that's going to hold uh, a lot of paint and water. In acrylics, you want a more stiff brush that's going to push your paint around. Okay. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat, and I'll keep my eyes open for them while I am, while I am drying this. So oh, we're almost there. Ah, oh, Bev Roberts is in the house. Hey, Bev. We're almost dry. So I'm working on cotton paper today. Uh, you can use whatever you like. I find that um, that cotton paper, it, it's really easy to do a good wash on cotton paper because it keeps a like a more level wash uh, when you're painting. Oh, 331 people are watching. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, we're, I think we're dry now. So um, if you also, after you do a wash, if you don't want to dry out, that's totally fine. You can wander off, get a cup of tea, 
come back, and then you'll always look at your painting with fresh eyes, so that's good. But before you go to paint on it again, it's a great idea to um, to put your hand down, the back of your hand, so you don't transfer oils, and you can feel how, uh, if it feels warm or room temperature, then it's dry. If it feels cool, it's still a little damp. This right here, somebody asked about it. It's the Heat It Tool by Ranger. It's a lot quieter than any other embossing tool that I have. That's what it is. It's an embossing gun. Um, I don't like, it doesn't melt embossing powder quite as well as my uh, Marvi Uchida embossing gun, but it works great for this, and I love that it's so quiet. Okay, so now we're going to start doing some more detailed things, and it really doesn't matter what part of the picture you want to work on first. I'm going to go right in and work on the flowers because I know that I want to have a couple different layers here. So the 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 paper had the image. What is the name of it, please? Oh, this is an this is Arches 140 pound cold press paper. And someone asks, um, a brush that is for acrylic and oil. An acrylic like Royal, will it work? Um, I like the Royal and Langnickel synthetic brushes. You don't want anything that's really stiff though, like for an oil, like an oil painting brush, because it could damage your paper. So just keep that in mind. You want it to feel soft, almost like a makeup brush for your watercolor. All right, and I'll take some more questions either when I'm drying or towards the end. So what I'm going to do here is um, I am going to because I want to keep this loose because I I have a problem where I overwork these pictures a lot. So um, I'm going to start just by kind of painting in some dabs with water kind of like um kind of like how i would paint the petals on a lilac just dab 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 but i'm doing it with water because i don't want my colors to get too dark now i'm going to go over to my palette i've got this little mix of um cobalt teal and violet to mix a little bit more up so you can see and then i'm just going to kind of Add it. I'm going to define the edge of that leaf that I have that I had sketched out right there. I'm just going to drop some of these colors in. Now, the nice thing about doing mixes is that sometimes when you put them into a wet and wet wash, they'll do some interesting things. Like cobalt teal will granulate, so I'll get some sedimentation and an interesting texture. And um, sometimes the pigments will separate a little bit, and that gives you just a very almost a pointillistic look in there. It's just a fun. Uh, a fun way to get some different effects in your painting. Now I'm going to grab a little bit more of the di dioxazine violet and just kind of dab it in and let the paint do its thing. I really don't want to fuss with this too much. I really want the paint to do the work. Now, while your paint is really wet, a thing that I like to do when I'm painting lilacs in watercolor is to use salt because it will give you that little starburst that really looks like um, how those petals are. The petals are kind of like four pointed little, um, there's four petals to each tiny little flower on um, on the head of a lilac. I don't know how many flowers are on one, probably hundreds uh, on each little spike, but each little flower is a little four petal, petal almost star looking flower. So what I'm gonna do is put a little kosher salt into my hand and I'm just going to sprinkle it. I don't want it all over my paper because I'm still working, but this is going to dry. If I wait till I'm done, all of my lilacs, it's going to dry. So I just want to put a little bit in there, and then I'll just I'll just set this aside for uh, for later. And then I'm going to move around to a heart that's not touching that one. I've got some more that are this color over here, and I'm just going to again paint it in with water. Notice how I'm moving my brush. Um, I'm using my the length of my brush kind of like it is um, a petal. I want these stem, the petals to kind of come off the stem of the flower. So I'm kind of turning my brush so every little dab I make is coming is pointing away from the center uh, or going in the direction it would come off of the uh, off of the stem. And this one is also one that's got a little more blue to it. So I'm going to go ahead and use that same mix of the um, dioxazine violet and cobalt teal. Now, if you don't have exactly the same colors I have, use what you have. You can always get those colors you want later, but use what you have for now. Um, honestly, it's more important that you get the, the value right or you get a little variety in there. If you don't have, it doesn't matter if you don't have the exact same colors I have. I think on this one, I might throw in a little bit of that um, purpley mauve color. Especially right around here on this leaf. I can sharpen up that edge. And then again, I'm going to go in with the salt. I should have got a little dish. 
I have some cute little salt dishes too. I never think to use them. They're not. They're in my prop drawer. Sometimes when I would take a photographs of cards, I would have them in there. That would be perfect. To have a little salt. One of my little salt chickens. Because I never get out the right amount. I don't just want to dump the salt on because it will go a little crazy. All right. And we can go ahead and do um, this time. What we do actually with a really watery mix. This is another way you can do it if you don't feel comfortable. And maybe you don't, or maybe you can't even tell where I'm putting the water. So if I do it with this really watery mix, you'll be able to see what I'm, the strokes that I'm doing here. They're really not fussy until I, they will be a little fussy once I get around the edge of something else like I see that I've got this kind of purple shape there it's more purpley so I want kind of a rough edge around that so that when I go and put that color I'm not overlapping and then I got my dioxazine violet and dab that in now since I have this so watery it's going to dry a lot lighter but that's all right because I usually go way too dark with my lilacs and so I'm trying to avoid that this time I love seeing that chat go by. I, uh, I peek up and I see all kinds of thanks to Joe. So awesome. Joe's being brilliant in the chat as usual. That's great. <laughs> all right. We're going to sprinkle on a little salt there. And I find if you're doing the salt in a light wash like this, it's much easier to remove the salt rather than if you have like a really thick wash. Um, sometimes when you have a really thick wash, it just it's almost sticks especially with like a really uh, heavily honey based paint like an M gram. I've done lilacs before. And I've dripped in the salt and it just wants to stick. So here, again, I'm using that really light wash so you can see my strokes. You can see how when I'm moving my, my brush around, I just get that direction kind of coming out from the center. Only thing I want to be really careful of is the edge there, just so that I have a nice sharp edge on that leaf. So all of these... Um, flowers we put on have been pretty cool in temperature because of the blue and the purple um, and that purple having so much blue on it when we do the ones with more of the mauve we're going to have uh, more of a pinky pinky warmer color to those and a little sprinkle of salt there okay so now we can do some of the mauve ones and I'm just going to actually, you know what, I'm just going to clean up a little area. I'm just going to clean this little section of my palette right up because it was a little too muddy looking. And we are going to mix up a little puddle of our mauve. Have it ready to go. Try to keep your salt out of your palette. Worst, the worst is sand in the palette. Man, I hate it when I get sand on my palette, but not enough to keep me from taking my paints out with me to the beach. Okay. Um, so I think I will do a little wa really watery wash of the mob just so you can see where I'm putting my, um, my water here. Now, a lot of times on your lilacs, you get these really, you get the unopened buds at the end, and they're just these little, like, tight shapes, and they usually tend to be that kind of mauve color. More water on there. And I've got an edge here. Of a, I've got two leaves here kind of coming in, so I just want to make sure that I get that edge. Okay, now we can charge it right up with more of that mauve and just start dabbing it in, especially these little buds at the edge. I love seeing the paint flow. Lucas really flows a lot. I don't know if they add something to their paint to make it like kind of flow like that, but it definitely has that characteristic. I kind of forgotten about that. It's it's a nice paint. It's kind of um and kind of like people kind of wonder, well, what's why is it so inexpensive? What's wrong with it? Um, I just think there must have been good exchange rates or something. I don't know because I I haven't had any issues with it at all. I had the little smaller sketcher box before I got the big the big set of forty eight. Okay, now I'm picking up some of the uh, dioxazine violet.
Oh, Cheryl can hear the birds too. I know. I love it. I, um, I'm usually working downstairs most of the time this, by this time of year, but it is so nice to sit here at my desk and look at the feeders. I'm going to go right off the paper with that. I might regret it, but uh, I feel like it's getting stopped too short, that, that little leaf there. Now I think I might actually drop a little water in there because I feel like I went a little too dark. So I'm just going to drop in some water and see what happens. I think I should be forcing some, yeah, I'm forcing some blooms in there. But that gives a nice texture for flowers. So a bloom is when you um, you drip you drip paint or water into a damp wash, and it kind of forces the um, the pigment around. It's kind of like what salt does, actually. Trying not to get too dark on my first layer here. Even though it's going to be a loose painting, I still want to have a few layers. So we're going to speed things up here. Um, I am going to wet a few of these at a time. I will just put a little bit of pigment on my brush just so you can see it. Now, if I were to let something this light dry, it would barely show up. So I just want you to keep that in mind. That's how little pigment is in there. It's just enough for you to see. And I'm so glad that I had a chance to come um, live on YouTube today because I just got back like at 1.30 last night from the school trip, the school music trip, and I was totally missing hanging out with my crafty peeps. And we'll get this one wet down here. All right, and now we're gonna, just going to jump around with our color. I'm going to start off with my um, with my mauve color and, oop, I got this on there look at that seeing like the paint just kind of like drop and burst I like to get some um, lively edges so I start a lot of these strokes on the dry paper especially with this mauve get kind of like those unopened blooms and then let them kind of float around you can see right there I decided that I wanted these flowers to be over that leaf a little bit and look at how brown that looks right there. Um, it just kind of got that muddy tone, almost like the flowers are starting to go by. That's why I had mentioned sketching out your leaves so you could avoid some of that. I mean, it's not a huge deal, but I just wanted to show you that's why I had you do that. Now I'm going to grab some of that dioxazine violet. I think I want to mix it in a little bit because it is such a potent color. I mean, look how black, it almost looks black when I have it like full strength right there. And I added water to that. That's not even full strength. Um, it's such a transparent, bright color, or not bright, just um, robust, I would say, color that it's uh, it just needs, it needs to be tempered a little bit. But it also makes it really nice, like if you're doing an iris and you're using that color, you have it has such a depth of color that you could go over and add veins and with that color and still be able to, it's still going to show up, you know, over most things. As long as you didn't get, go too crazy with it to begin with and make everything way too dark. I like to put a little bit of that, like especially if it's underneath something, because it helps get you a little bit of... Um, depth do a little bit back there on that little bit of flower okay oops, something's drying off i think i might actually drip a little bit of water into some of these let them bloom a little bit have those little happy painting accidents there oh yeah i want to make sure i have a nice organic edge there because it's overlapping the mason jar and i think i want to darken up this area in here because it's kind of behind and in the depths of this bouquet 
All right. And now I'm going to, you know what? Maybe I'm going to introduce a little bit of that cobalt teal. I'm going to try the cobalt teal mixed in with my mauve. Oh, that gives it a, a very gray, kind of gray purple, but I think that might work right here. So now I'm going to sprinkle on my last bit of salt for this layer and we can actually work on the um we can work on the jar and the tabletop while that's drying we don't have to wait for that or dry it so that's all right that's good i think i'm gonna drop a little bit of water into that section right there and force a few blooms because it's kind of too late for salt we'll see what happens there all right I'm just going to make sure there's no salt on the bottom part of my picture where I'm trying to work. And I think that I will start off, I think I'm going to go back in with this brush because I just, and it's really just handy, and kind of get my edges of the vase. I don't want it to be completely... Um, wet. I just want to kind of get some get some areas here. And then I think I'm going to use this little angle. I really like this brush. It's a, a Royal Majestic. It comes in a, like a five piece set that's got a bunch of handy brushes in it. I'll add the link after the broadcast. But it's um, it's just such a really great brush for side loading, which I know is more of a decorative painting technique. But I'm telling you what, it's one of the best techniques to know as a watercolorist. And I'm just going to go in and give that jar a little definition and i keep my pigment to the pointy end of the brush and i can always remember what side the 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 paint is on so you can do this totally do this with a flat brush but it's just a little easier to manipulate with the with the uh angle and also it's easy to remember where your paint is Gosh, you know, I almost just want to leave my, I almost just want to leave it like that. Why? Well, I think I'm going to leave it like that for now and maybe work on the table a little bit. And I'm going to go back to that wide flat. And I think I'm going to just define my table edge. And I'm actually, you can't see this, but I'm going to stand up and look straight down on my paper while I do that because, and I'm doing it with water. So I don't know if you can see, if that will show, if you can see, you probably can't see the glossiness. Of that but basically what I'm doing is going across like that with my brush because I want to air I want to be able to kind of float water in there but I but I want to be able to control where it goes as opposed to like our first wash where it was just kind of willy-nilly now I'm just kind of looking at it and I'm just gonna jump over here I just because it's hard to see if you're straight or not <laughs> unless you have when it's just the water Okay, I think I've got a fairly straight wet line across. So like this was not very even <laughs> to begin with, so I made it up a little higher on this side. Uh, now I'm going to grab my burnt sienna. I think I'm going to mix it out a little bit. I'm going to grab a little endothrone blue. Oh, that's pretty. And you could use ultramarine blue and burnt sienna if those are the colors you're using. Use, or if you're using Prussian blue in your picture, use whatever blue you've used that's not the cobalt teal because that's a little too too light. I'm standing up again. I know you can't see that, but it helps if you can look um, look down on it. Oh, somebody asked today if it, you should use cold press paper or hot press paper for flowers. I have to say it really depends on your personal style. If you're a botanical artist and you're doing extremely detailed work, you may prefer a hot press paper because it's it's smoother. Um, I tend to prefer a cold press paper because I like having a little texture there, but it's, you know, it's really kind of up to you. I'm bringing this into my vase because vases are clear, but I am dragging that color around because the water in the vase is going to refract the light, refract the surroundings. And I don't think I want to pull this all the way around because I kind of like the vignette that I'm getting by having some soft stuff around the edges and having it a little more focused in the middle. I'm going to keep that mix on my palette because I can use that um, as I'm going in to put darks and other details uh, on the vase. So I really don't 
think I want to do much to the vase. So uh, I think what I'm going to do is dry this. So if you have any questions, just get them ready. I think I might add a little bit more burnt of the burnt sienna to my table. So if you have questions, go ahead and get them ready. As soon as I start dry, uh, drying, then pop them in the chat. Yeah, I want to put a little more. I like that burnt sienna in there. It's uh, It gives us a nice warmth and organic quality, I think. So with a cold press paper, it's going to stay wetter longer. It just, it almost like it neutral, naturalizes, neutralizes, it normalizes. That's what I'm going for. It normalizes the water, it seems like. So with the cellulose paper, you might have some spots completely drying and you're trying to do a wash and you're getting frustrated because it is, um, you go, you'll one part with a puddle and you'll have another part that's bone dry and it's a little more difficult to, I'm grabbing a little yellow, it's a little bit more difficult to, figure out what's going to happen it's a little more unpredictable with what with cotton paper it's um it if you wet your paper it stays wetter longer and you don't have as many issues like that and okay now i'm just getting i'm getting everything muddled together i need to i need to stop and let it dry all right, so I'll be looking for your questions as I dry everything up. All right. Oh, you know who's in the chat? I there's a there's somebody in the chat named Inklips. He has a really cool stamping YouTube channel, and I just had seen that a couple of his videos. Uh, so welcome. Let's see. Chrissy's here. Bev's here. Co girls here. Anthony is here. Question. Anthony asks, "What do you think?" are the most versatile watercolor pigments um you know honestly there i, I really um believe in a split primary system and i have a um uh oh shoot the chat's going so fast um i believe in like a, a cool and a warm version of each color uh the daniel smith essential set has a cool and warm version of each color um so like you have a, a cool red and a warm red and so on and so forth. And I also think sap green and burnt sienna and yellow ochre added to that mix is great. And somebody asked where in Brewer I sell my artwork. At the Schoolhouse Antiques Mall in Brewer, Maine is where I sell my artwork. Question. Oh, gosh, you're going so quickly. Um, shoot. The question just went by. I just missed a bunch. I'm going to try to go back here. Um, let's see. Question: Will there be a pet? Oh, thank you for the thank you for the super chat. That is, that's awesome. I believe that's Denise. Her name isn't showing up. Um. Okay. Uh, I have completely lost all <laughs> of everything here. Um, I've completely lost my place. I am going to ask anybody that has submitted a question to resubmit it right now because I have just lost the entire, my entire place here. Okay. Donna Luters. Thank you, Donna, for the super chat. That is awesome. Why do you think your name is Denise? <laughs> like, um, I can't think on the spot here. Um, thank you, Grace. Donna Luters. Yes, yeah, she is awesome. And question, would you recommend a professional watercolor pencil? Yes, um, I like the Derwent brand of watercolor pencils. I also like the Albright Drewer. Um, Albright Drewer is more expensive, but the um, but the Derwents are very nice as well. If you are if you want to make sure you get a light fast pencil though, I would look for the Albright, Albright Drewers. And I do believe the Karen Dosh has a line that's called Museum that is light fast, meaning it won't fade. So you just want to kind of keep that in mind. I will take questions at the end. So if you um, if you have any and I didn't get a chance to answer them, then you can go ahead and do that. All right, this is this is dry. So I'm going to go ahead and brush this off. I think I'm going to use a dry paper towel. Hopefully this won't be loud on the microphone because I keep my paper towels <laughs> in a mug that my microphone is hooked to. Very fancy. I like to do this so I don't like accidentally have water on my hands or any oil on my hands. And yes, you definitely need to make sure the paper is dry when you brush your salt off or it's going to smear. All right. Fromage asks, Lindsay, whenever I paint, I always get gray areas when it dries. Any idea why? 
Um, gray areas. It must be like your pigments mixing maybe more than you anticipated. Maybe you had two colors next to each other that were complementary. Okay. You can kind of feel too when you're doing this with a towel. And when you if it feels like sandpaper when you're going over an area, you still have salt there. And sometimes it's hard to tell that. Otherwise, this probably sounds like fingernails on a chalkboard because the microphone is pretty close. But like that area is kind of gray. That's where we had that green underneath and the purple on top because they kind of cancel each other out. The red and that purple and the green, they're they're very close to op opposite, so they want to neutralize each other. Okay, so you can very gently also kind of feel your paper. If you have any salt, just flick it off with your fingers. There we go. Now we've got some really cool textures in our flowers. And I'll tip it a little bit. Sometimes the glare can make it not show up as well. But see those little like bursty uh, colors that are bursty shapes that gives us almost like the texture of a, of a lilac where it's got those tiny little bursts of flowers everywhere. So I don't want to work on the flowers yet because I want to kind of let them, I want to let my eyes rest and work on something else. So I'm going to go ahead and go on to the leaves. And one of the ways I like to do leaves is slide loading. And um, especially if I have a nice crisp edge. So what I think I'm going to do is um, start, I'm going to take a few colors, mix up a few puddles, a few puddles of color. Color, my goodness. I keep getting distracted by looking at the chat. <laughs> but I will hang around for a few minutes after the uh, the demo's done and will and I'll answer questions. So. so that way I can not get flustered looking at the chat right now. All right, I'm gonna take a little bit of the permanent yellow light. I'm gonna mix, I'm just gonna make a little puddle of that. I'm going to take some of the uh, olive green or sap green. This is happens to be olive green. Either will work. And I'm going to grab a little bit of that indithrone blue. Oh, whoops, that's the yellow blue. I don't want that one. There we go. And the because it's kind of like an indigo, it does tend to darken your colors quite a bit and desaturate them. Um, even though it's a single pigment color, it still tends to desaturate the um, the sap green or olive green, so you do get a really nice shadow. And so what I think I'm going to do is load my brush up mostly with the um, the sap green and the a little bit of the yellow, and then I'm going to get the tip in that mix with the indithrone. And I am going to paint this leaf. I'm going to tip it, so hopefully my hand's not in the way, because I do tend to hold it fairly close to the the tip. And I am going to just go in there and, and paint that leaf. And then I'm just going to come around back the other way. So I end up with a lighter in the center and a little bit darker on the edge. I want it a little more darker, which I think I do because it's a little, it's a little timid. I'm going to just mix up a little bit more of that. And I can actually drop it in there if I want. I like to have a little darker at the end, at the bottom too, just because um, usually that's where it's kind of nestled in. And then I can soften that edge. So I dipped my brush in the water and I just dabbed it off on the towel and soften that edge there. If I want to brighten that leaf, I can grab a little of that yellow. So it just helps to have your colors kind of handy. Once you're pretty happy with the colors you have in there, the leaves are, are quite a bit uh, darker than the other colors. Then I can drag my little uh, scraper through it and get a few um, veins in there. And then if I look at that and I say, hmm, I think those veins are a little, they look a little stark. Then I can go in, make another, just grab a little bit of the indithrone and my olive. I can add a little bit of that in there. Now, you are less likely to get blooms on a cotton paper. That's another thing. If you did this on a wood pulp paper, you might have to continue on and just repaint the leaf, kind of going in with your lighter colors as you came forward. Um, it's not that big of an issue with the cotton paper, but if you are using cellulose paper, just, just add a little bit of that like yellowy 
color on your brush and just bring it around. And those colors will settle into the grooves. So even though you're darkening the leaf, you're also going to darken those veins a little bit. But it does, since we are making it a little bit darker, it does kind of help them settle in and seem a little more natural. There we go. So we're going to do that for the other leaves. Another thing you could do if you if you really don't like the uh, load, side loading or double loading on your brush, you can go ahead and just wet your leaf and do a wet and wet wash or an open drip kind of wash in there. So I would go in with my lightest color first with my permanent yellow light with a little bit of the olive green in the center. Then I would just do the olive green kind of at the bottom and going around. This is going to take longer to dry because you've got so much more water in there. And then I want to grab a little of that Indithrone Blue. And I'll just add that in my darkest shadow areas where it's kind of tucking, nestling behind that, um, that lilac. There. Now, um, you do get a little bit more of an interesting wash, I think, this way. Interesting because your colors are going to kind of float around and blend. So you can do whichever you like. And then if you do get it too dark, you can just kind of crumple up your paper towel and just lightly dab and remove a little bit of color. Okay, so really, um, what you know, you can paint this however you, you can paint each leaf however you like, but those are a couple different ways that you can do it. When I'm doing like something small, um, if it's a little too small to get in there and do a blended wash, then I can go in and just kind of wet it and put in my colors. That works really well. Oh, we have 369 people in here right now. That's cool. I've gotten so used to having Sarah here to, to ask me questions and to, to, uh, to talk with on the live streams. My husband uh, asked if if I wanted him to do the live stream while I was gone. And I thought, oh, you know, that would probably be pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> There's some doodling. And that's this is another way you can do it. Um, I just kind of put in that dark color because it was on my brush, and then I just pulled some yellow into it. I don't really have any green, any of that medium color in there, though. And try different things. I mean, see what you like the best. It's more of that dark in there. I like that. I think I like this technique the best, actually, for this paper and this, uh, this subject. So let's do that again. I'm going to turn my paper around a little bit, though. And I am going to, I'll start in with a mix of the, um, the green and the endothrome blue. And then I'm going to use some of just the olive green on its own. And now I'm just going to, I think I'll just grab the yellow because of that, that uh, green was so strong. And just carry it up. I think I like the blend and gradation from that technique quite a bit. And now I am going to scrape in some veins. All right, I go back in with a little bit of that darker color. I feel like that part's drying a little quicker and it might give me a bloom to where I don't want it. And I can also, if I do feel like I need a little more definition of I've got a light edge and I'm like, hmm, it doesn't really show up very well, oh, I can go ahead and darken it. Question, how does the scraper create the veins? Is it the pressure of the paper or pulling the color down? The scraper works because 
um, you are basically damaging the paper. Honestly, you are scribing it. You're almost like digging a little uh, gully in there or you're marring the surface. So you only want to do it if you're absolutely sure that you don't want to remove it. That that's what's going to stay there. So that's the that's the only thing to to remember. I can't believe I looked up there, saw a question, read it, and answered it without like uh, messing up. Question: I had a stroke more than a year ago, and the only thing that's still bothering me is that I can't draw straight lines. Can I use a ruler for the shadow on the table? Absolutely. You got to use whatever is going to make your painting more enjoyable. And there's nothing wrong with using a ruler. And I'm sure I missed some other questions in there, so please hang on to the end and I will try and answer them for you. And I'm just adding a little bit more of that dark color in there. I think it's nice to add the color too after you scrape. It just gives it um, it just gives it a little bit more, I don't know, harm, harm, harmony maybe? Okay, so now I think I do want that base a little bit brighter. So I am going to grab a little bit of the cobalt teal. Maybe a little bit of that yellow that I still had on my palette. Just mix it in there. Oops, I forgot a leaf. I should get right in there and paint that right now, actually. Let me just finish slapping this little bit of cobalt teal in there. I forgot that little leaf I sketched on there. Let's get let's get that taken care of. Let's start with the dark. That blue, that green, that almost looks black like that, doesn't it? I'm cleaning my brush because that's really strong. Adding a little bit of just the green on its own. And I am going to put a little yellow in there. Okay. Oh, I think I like that one the best out of all the leaves. All right. And I think I'll also put some stems in there. I'm going to use a little burnt sienna with some of the some of that green, I think. Okay, I think I want to put, actually, I think I want to put a water line in the vase so that it'll look like when the branches hit the water, they get kind of distorted. So I'm going to do some kind of skinny branches up top and then pull down some fatter ones. And those don't have very much color to them, so I'm going to drop in a little bit of color. Drop in a little of that green as well. I think sometimes when you're painting really loose, you have to kind of just have faith that it's going to turn out okay, because otherwise it can feel a little... A little scary when you put in some you know distinct lines and colors to get little slices of color that I'm using in the picture because it helps flesh out the vase okay now, I think I want to go to the flowers a little bit, let the vase rest, because I like to work on different parts of the picture, and if the table jiggles, it's because I'm really like, getting up and off my tape, my chair to like stand up and look at it. Um, I think it's nice because if I'm focusing on the vase, I'm not looking at the flowers. If I'm looking at the leaves, I'm not really focusing on the flowers, so I get to um, kind of give my eyes a little bit of a rest. You can switch to a different size brush if you want, but to keep this loose, I'm going to stick with my big one. I'm going to turn my paper a little bit. And um, I do have to keep in mind that some of these uh, leaves are wet, so I just have to be kind of careful there. And I'm just going to tap in a few, like, buds on the edge. Try to put a few little star... 
don't like it to be too detailed, so I just kind of want some little smushy values. I really don't want to go overboard because I like some of these have some really cool shapes. Like I wanted maybe darken that up a little bit because it's kind of behind everything. So, but just up in the top of it. So I've got just a little bit of that dioxazine violet on my brush, and I'm just kind of tapping kind of where it is behind that leaf. And I'm going to go back here. Tap that there. I think I'll do a little bit over here, get this one a little bit defined. So I'm basically trying to break apart some of these shapes that have kind of modeled together. A little bit of pink, but I don't want to do too much. And this is the purple. It's called purple, but it's like a permanent mauve. Um, I don't want to do too much because I really like what the salt did, and I don't want to like uh, cover that up. And any place I feel like I've got too much on there, I can just go in with a wet brush and just kind of dab it. Um, now up here I've got this kind of like blob of flowers. So um, I feel like I wanted to define things a little bit up there. So I'm going to grab a little of the purple. And there is this, I wanted, we did darken a little bit before, but I just kind of want to get, to get this, this chunk of flowers separated from this chunk of flowers. So I'm just going in there. That might need to be darkened. It's pretty watery, so I'm not 100% sure right now. I might need to darken it a little bit, but it's going to break it apart a little bit. Then back here, there's a chunk of flowers that I kind of want to, um, that I want to kind of darken up. I'm trying so hard not to get distracted by the triad because it's so cool to see what you guys are saying. I can never see it usually. If Sarah's here, she, uh, she runs that for me. So I don't see what you guys are chit-chatting about. And then after the show, I can't go back and look at much of it. I can maybe see like the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of comments. So I never quite know what you guys talk about. Very curious. Um, so Lynn was asking in chat about protecting your paintings. Um, I will... The keepers, I usually frame under glass, but generally I sell my stuff before they're in frames. So um, I put them in an archival bag with like usually a piece of mat board just to keep it from getting damaged in shipment. And then um, and then they can frame it at their leisure. I, humidity will bother it if it gets wet, but behind glass with a mat, it's not going to get harmed. Um, I would think that the, the actually the fixative that you use could harm it more than... Um, than any humidity as long as you're you know taking normal care with it okay i am going to let's see that looks like it may be a little dark i'm gonna add a little water to that so what i've done is the indithro blue and the um cobalt teal smidgen of the purple and i'm just gonna go uh add a little bit not much because i really like what these kind of pale blue flowers are doing just a, a few little dabs here and there and gosh I think I, I think I really just like what that one is doing maybe just a little bit up here where there's so many colors coming together And hmm, just a little bit at the base of this one. I kind of ran out of color though, so into throne blue and cobalt teal, smidgen of purple. Because sometimes lilacs have that more of the cooler blue tones to them, or almost like a gray. Then you have the white ones, those are really pretty too. We had a white one growing in our yard, but just couldn't keep it. It just didn't. It just didn't do well. I think we had too much acid in our soil with the pine trees. 
and I'm gonna I'm just going in with a wet brush and just damp not really softening wet I'm just softening some of those those marks that I made because they seemed a little bit too stiff okay so sometimes you'll see little spots I feel like they they don't look quite right because they're really light in the center of all of these flowers and there's a couple things you could do you could do any of the colors that are surrounding them but you can also like kind of poke some green in there and I think that that's what I'd like to try so I don't end up with big kind of like so I don't have like big purple blobs so I think I'm just going to tuck in little bits of green I like that um, and then I think I might put a little bit of green maybe in the base area as if it's like stuff hanging down the back side maybe just a little bit of that mob in there too because it could be flowers on the back side as well kind of dangling down and then I want to work on the tabletop a little bit and um, I think I actually want to brighten up the color of the vase a little bit I'm just gonna blast this real quick I don't think I'll have enough time to answer questions but if I see any while I'm while I'm blasting then I will um, then I will answer them basically I want to dry that layer so I can glaze over a more vibrant layer of color question can we get a link or name for the bags you use for storage of paintings until sale I was wondering um, if it was accept an acceptable thing just the other day thanks for sharing yes um, but I get mine from there's two places I've got them from paper Mart, but you have to get like a package of a 500 or a thousand and I've gotten them from Jerry's Artorama but what you want to look for is um, polypropylene clear cello polypropylene bags a lot of times it will say cello with air quotes around it or I guess they're not air I guess they're just close if they're typed but um, that's what you're looking for generally you can find them in packages of 10 to 100 as well so you don't need to get a humongous assortment unless you know you use a lot of certain size I have um, a largest a large pack of 16 by 20 and 11 by 14s because that's generally what I sell and then I will just um, fold over the back so that works for me so what I'm gonna do this is gonna be a little weird but I'm actually going to wet the um, I'm going to wet the table because I want our color, what I paint in the vase, I want it to spill out onto the table. I'm not going all the way up to the, the line of the back of the table. I just kind of am getting, I'm pulling left and right and slightly under. And then I'm going to grab a bunch of the cobalt teal. I think I'm just going to start with that and then I can add some of the other blue as well. Add a little bit of water to that okay i didn't leave any bright white highlights on this i might need to uh either slice out a gel pen with an exacto knife or grab the old gel pen um oh i guess well i guess i'll be grabbing the gel pen because i took that with me on the trip thinking i was going to create some masterpieces on the bus ride which didn't never got it out um so there won't be gel pen in this anyway <laughs> I don't think I have enough paint on there. Let me mix up a little of that blue and see what that does. I don't know if those two colors, those two colors don't seem to be too vivid. They're almost milky together. Those two pigments are milky acting. So I don't know if I'm going to get a good result. It kind of flows out nice though. I bet I'll get some good granulation because I think that Indithrone Blue might granulate as well. Question, when I used Absorbing Ground on canvas board for watercolor, Oops, my screen went sleep. Um, how many coats should I use? Um, I think it recommends a couple thin coats. If I am, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it does recommend a couple thin coats. Um, that said, I would use whatever. You're going on a white ground. You just need it. You need to give it some tooth and absorbency. I don't know. I would do one or two coats. I think I don't think you need to go too crazy with it. All right, so I'm mixing up also some of that um, cobalt teal in permanent yellow light because that gives me a really nice canning jar color. Let me get some of that in the in the table as well. I'm going to spray this because I'm getting too dark and I'm getting too fussy.
Okay, and remember, I don't have anything. I do have a supply list kind of in the video description, but I haven't linked anything up. If you need specific um, links and colors, I will add that later. I just haven't gotten that far yet. Oh, my kitty cat's at the back door. She's put her paws up. How cute. <laughs> Let me in. Okay, so now I'm just going to look at it, tip it up a little bit, and try to figure out what I think it needs. I'm really thinking it needs some splatter, but I think I want something a little bit <clears throat> a little bit different than typical splatter. So what I think I want to do is actually splatter some water and then splatter some paint so I get some interesting little um, bursts of color. So I think I will just kind of spray a couple little areas. So I already have some interest, interesting stuff happening. And then I'm going to flick on some water. I'm going to do that with my bigger flat brush that I was using earlier. I'm going to do it off to the side because I have another computer there that I really don't want to hit with water. That poor thing is old and barely hanging on as it is. I don't need to add any other strife to its life. And then I'm going to spatter. I think I'm going to spatter on that cobalt teal because... I really, that's one of my favorite, I think like if I had to pick up my favorite watercolor, I mean generally my favorite color is red, but I think if I had to pick a favorite watercolor, it would be cobalt teal. It's such a pretty color. Now I think I'll do some of that permanent yellow light because it's really going to set off that, uh, the yellow, the uh, purple, I think. Wow, that was a little, that was pretty bright. I think that's a little too much actually. I'm going to blot. And I think I'll do, I think I'll do some more teal actually. There we go. That's what I want. Let's see. I love how on the wet areas you get these really cool soft edges. <laughs> Alexandra says she's already splattering. <laughs> well, we are an hour in, so it's going to happen sometime. All right, I'm thinking I want a little bit of burnt sienna, but I think burnt sienna on its own is too strong. I want to do a little bit of that indithrone blue and burnt sienna, get that nice gray going. I think that would be quite flattering with those other colors. And I also think I want to do some of the purple. Sometimes when you splatter something too close to red, it does look a little bloody, so I don't think I want it too bloody. Yeah, I like that. Oh, well, heck, maybe a little bit of that permanent, uh, permanent mauve color. Yeah, I like that. I love how, like, you get this kind of, it's not really mud, but it's just these almost, like, shadows that kind of meld together. We definitely have more of a light source over here now, which I think is kind of interesting. All right, so get ready with your questions. I am going to, um, I'm going to be taking some in a second while I do this, uh, another dry here, and then I'm going to come back and we're going to put some final details. I just realized I have some bleed proof white, white downstairs that would be perfect for adding little highlights on the vase, but, um, but boy, if I planned better, <laughs> we could have seen that in action, but uh, I don't have anybody run, run down there for me. All right, so I am going to take a peek for questions. All right, Blesdy, I can't pronounce it, Blesdy God 7 asks, what was the name of the heat gun again and the name of the blues you used? And does your husband paint too? This is the heated tool by Ranger. Um, and I used cobalt teal and indithrone blue. And my husband paints models. Like he'll do like model um, airplanes and things. Oh, thank you, Tika Carr. She says this is gorgeous. Oh, uh, Bella would like to see this as a poster for a future lilac festival. <laughs> White Wave does not like the spattering, but that's okay, White Wave, because you can do it however you want to do. Oh, hi, Melody. How are you? She's in the in the house. Melody Lane is a wonderful YouTube channel. <laughs> Sandra says it looks like we're looking through a dirty window at a lovely vase. Well, you're probably looking out. You're probably looking in my house. If you're looking at a dirty, a dirty window. Oh boy, we're really mixed on the spatter. I can see. Okay, so Giz Lane. I sorry, I probably pronounced that wrong. Asks, I'm having trouble when coming to the color and water ratio since sometimes um, it's more transparent on the paper. Do you have any tips? It's always going to dry lighter, so account for that by putting darker colors. Oh, Grace, yes, my husband's actually with the girls at a Little League game tonight. Uh, they have a game in the morning. I'm going to do the morning game, so we kind of split it up, and there's a lot of games in the weekend. I just missed a question. 
Um, uh, please, I, somebody's just went off the screen and I missed it. Um, Fromage asks, hey, Lindsay, how come you never sign your work? You might, but I after the live streams because um, I take, I'm, I have bad handwriting and I can't talk and write at the same time, not even my own name. What's the difference between VS French Ultramarine and Ultramarine Blue? French Ultramarine is slightly more purple. Just it's so minimal that you don't need to have both colors. <laughs> All right, I am going to try to scroll back really quick and see that question that I missed. I'm probably not going to do it successfully. Oh, uh, Lindsay Johnson asks, would you use the mimic brushes for gouache? Well, you know, you can because gouache is essentially just watercolor that's opaque. However, I find that when I paint with gouache, I like to use it thicker. And um, and those these brushes are a little too soft to push around the thicker paint. Oh, Bev thanks me for blessing you with an unexpected live tutorial. Well, thank you. Okay, so now what we've ha what has happened with our spattering is that we have softened, softened some of the edges, and that's kind of what we wanted. However, on the base, we want hard edges because it's a hard glass object. So um, I want to go ahead and bring back some of those hard edges, and I think I actually might go in, actually use a smaller brush, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually grab... A synthetic because I know it's not going to hold too much water. These are actually like kids synthetic brushes. I'm just trying to get a small flat somewhere. There we go. Um, but when I when you don't want to have a lot of paper, a lot of paint, or a lot of water, using a synth uh, just a regular synthetic as opposed to like a faux fur synthetic will really help. And I'm going to go in with the uh, cobalt teal. And I think I'm actually going to put a smidgen of dioxazine violet because when I tried the Indithrone blue, I think Indithrone blue is a little bit more opaque. It just got really um, almost gray and muddy, and I feel like I'll get a little bit better of a shadow if I use the dioxazine violet because it's a more transparent, super dark color. And I, what you want to do is avoid outlining, but you want to get some of those sharp lines in there. All right, so I wouldn't outline the whole thing. I just try to catch a few uh, details here and there. And another thing you can do with these brushes, since they don't hold a ton of water, is you can dry brush them with them. So you can kind of start a line, start a nice sharp chisel edge, and then drag it down. And as you pull down your light get your stroke gets a little lighter and then it will get a little bit streaky it doesn't look too streaky when you're going over something like this it just kind of subtly um gives you just a softer a softer look and uh that can look really nice in the final touches you don't want to do it all the time um because everything could just look a little too textured but it's nice for those final edges now i think i'm actually going to go back to my other syn regular synthetic the majestic which i really do enjoy and I like it because I can, even though this is wider, I can still get a really nice straight line. And I can pull some streaks out that way. Now I'm going to do, I'm going to turn this upside down because with vases, I find that I paint one side a lot easier than the other. So if I flip it around, then I get a much better, um, I get a much better, um, symmetrical or chance at symmetry. Symmetry. So again, I have the uh, cobalt teal, a little bit of the dioxazine violet, and I am just going to kind of define this a little bit. Maybe even grab the back edge of the vase. You'd see like from the inside and kind of pull that up. I kind of feel like I've lost my lips there at the bottom. I just want to give a hint of it. Okay, I'll tip that. I feel like I've got it squared off on that side a little bit more, so I just want to kind of copycat that side over here. All right, then I think I might just wet an area and dripple, dripple, is that a word? Add a little bit of like cobalt teal in there because I just love that color. I love having glazes of it. It's just such a pretty color. Yeah, I'm just I'm just uh, kind of wetting an area and just dripping some colors and letting it float up. So now I'm gonna do the cobalt teal with the yellow. I actually had some mixed here still. 
I hope my wheel is kind of faded away. All right, and I still need some more color on the table. I think somebody was just asking about UK places to shop, places to shop in the UK. Um, there's been a few times that I've ordered stuff on Amazon and actually comes from Society for All Artists in the UK. And they, they shipped very, I mean, it took them a while to get it over here, but I would imagine you have really quick shipping over there and the stuff came very reasonably at the price that, you know, it was what I, what I bought for the price, you know, for good prices. So, I mean, if they can sell it to Americans for a good price, I don't see why they wouldn't sell it to their own fellow um, Britons for the same price. And also I've, I've ordered from Jackson's, I've ordered half pans from them because I couldn't get them anywhere in the United States and they shipped very quickly and they were, um, they were very reasonable. They only charged like 350 for shipping. So I would say either of those outfits in the UK would be a good place to start if you're looking for something. And a little bit of that uh, mauve in here too. I just think it's pretty. And I want some of the vase actually. I think I'll dab it in as if it's a flower in the back. Maybe throw a little bit of the wet paint down here. All right. All right, so what I would like, if you have any questions, go ahead and add them in the description. Um, oh, and Joey says he can back me up with SA, a Society for All Artists. Ordered several trial paper packs from them. Very good. Okay, good. So I have other people that had good good um, experiences through them. So I'm thinking, I'm just going to look at this painting. I'm going to look, look for your questions, and I'm going to think about maybe adding some pastel on top. If you have any opinions on that, please feel free to say yay or nay in the comments and um honestly it's gonna be what i decide if i put pastel on there or not i guess but if, i'd love to hear your opinions and um if you have questions go ahead and fire away because we're getting near the end and um i will answer them and if i missed your question earlier i do apologize please pop them in there again um okay oh blix ships internationally i didn't know that that's good to know all right yes to pastels Donna says, beautiful. Thank you, Donna. Um, let's see. Terry Carter, uh, Val says, those are called soft tools. Jerry Blick. Oh, oh, those soft tools. Yes, from uh, by for Pam Pastels. I'm to totally just like butting in on your conversation. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I mean, I catch the ends. Um, oh, soft pastels. Jenny says, yes. Okay. Oh, Oh, Raywin Adventures tried to post a link to our class, but it censored you. Um, one of the moderators could post a link to the essential watercolor technique class if they want to, or it's in the video description. It's in the uh, the signature in the video description, so you can find it that way. Tika has had a bad experience with Blick. They never shipped pencils and tried to charge me for what they didn't ship. Oh, that that stinks. I've never had a problem with Blick. I've because I order frames a lot from them, and anytime like I've had any problems, they they've actually shipped me out a new frame and not asked for the other one back. I usually snap a picture of the damage, and they because it just happens when you order a lot of frames, you occasionally get a get a bummer one. But um, but well, that's too bad. I'm sad to hear that. You know what though, Tika? I had a uh, thing a Mod Podge go missing. I think it like spilled on a UPS truck. I can't even imagine the mess they had to clean up because it was a whole gallon of Mod Podge. Because I got like half an order and it looked a little sketchy. It was repacked. I'm like, where's the gallon of Mod Podge? What happened there? <laughs> oh my goodness, I just missed my uh, I missed where I was. Give me a second, guys. I'm glad this is at the end of the replay. So, <laughs> so anybody that's watching, hopefully, isn't too frustrated watching the replay. Um, uh, question is Lucas gouache good for professional finish work or Windsor Newton better? Well, I've got to tell you, Lindsay Johnson, who asked this question, um, see, Sarah is so good at this. I'm just such a goof. Um, Lucas gouache, I don't know about the light fastness. They, they use tried and true um, pigments just like your watercolors. However, because they add so much white to that to make it opaque and the other opacifiers that they add, it does diminish light fastness because you're spreading out those molecules of pigment so much that it makes them more vulnerable, basically is what happens. And that's the same thing that happens with um, designer gouache from Windsor and Newton. I believe the only light fast gouache, um, so if you want to do it and you want to frame it under glass and put it on the wall in the sunlight, would be uh, Schminka and um, M. Graham and Holbein. I believe those three have light fast washes, but um, 
generally gua sha year is meant to be scanned and you made prints of okay i'm going to try to go back i think uh okay maria asks when putting the paint out to mix i end up soaking up what's already there what am i doing wrong when putting the paint out to mix i end up soaking up what's already there maria could you elaborate on your question please i'm not quite sure what you mean um and i'm going to scroll through and see what other questions i missed um oh thank you barbara leon i'm probably pronouncing that wrong because it's got those little accents over the vowels um she says my live streams are the best i appreciate that okay Sharon Shannon Foster says I'm late to the show. This is beautiful as always. I'll watch the replay tomorrow. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Um, oh, Rhonda, we're we're still we're still here. <laughs> she said so she missed the live, but we'll be here for a few more minutes. If you have a question, go ahead and ask. Um, question: What what brand is your teal paint? These are all from the Lucas. Uh, 1862. Thanks, Val. She just actually answered that. Um, but cobalt teal. I also like the Daniel Smith. I also like. Um, Let's see, what's the other brand? Oh, Turner. I haven't seen a cobalt teal that I didn't like, actually. Um, what about Karen? I have never used Karen Dosh gouache. I've used the the um, watercolor crayons. I'm not sure about the light fastness on those. Karen Dosh generally is high in light fastness. I honestly didn't even know they had a gouache. Maybe it's like pans, pans of paint. Um, you can always email them, um, and they should answer you. I don't know if they have an English customer service, but... Um, but I would try that. Let's see. Uh, Chrissy asks if there'll be a traceable or pattern. There won't be because I didn't draw it beforehand. I just went in and painted. Other than other than that rounded rectangle we made for the vase, that's all we have. Um, question, how do you use gouache to fix a watercolor picture? Well, gouache is opaque, so if you make a mistake, you can paint on top of watercolor and it will uh, cover it up. Question, on the palette, blue is there and Quinn, and it just sucks up the blue. Okay, so the um, the quin your quinacridone colors are very strong. And because of that, they can overpower a lot of other colors. So I would just um, maybe, oh shoot, I put my flower palette away. Maybe if you had something with wells kind of like this and you made, you made a puddle in each well and then kind of, um, move the stronger color over to the weaker color until you got the right mix. It's something that that um, practice will help you with. And I'm just going to scoot back a little bit because I think I missed a couple. Question, would you consider doing a tutorial in oil pastels, asks Jane Mulraney. Um, I have done a few, and definitely I'd love to do some more. Um, I did I had mixed media, actually, were they allowed? lupins, mixed media lupins, and I did use oil pastels in that. Um, yes, uh, Indy Paul wants to know if I'll put a list of products. Yes, I'll, I'll put that in right after the show is done. Um, Maria B asks, on the palette, blue is there and Quinn is there. Oh, I'm sorry, we already did that. You guys are missing Sarah. I can totally, <laughs> totally imagine right now. Okay, question. Will the absorbing ground give me the effect? Will absorbing ground give me effects the same as you did here, or what effects does it usually give with watercolor? Um, okay, when you're using absorbent ground on a canvas or a tin or on any or like a board, any other surface, it's meant to mimic watercolor paper. So you'll get a very similar look. Um, I find that my paint looks a lot lighter on absorbent ground, but I do use it quite a bit. Actually, I've got an illustration I can show you. I'm just gonna scooch over here to the other end of my studio and just grab it real quick. So I tend to use absorbent ground more as an illustrator, and I use it to. Fit Fix mistakes when like a client needs a change so I'm just gonna find right here uh, this cover that I did for a book um, the I had to rework the face pretty substantially so in order to be able to do that I used absorbent ground to kind of paint over an area so I could paint on top like this uh, sea glass they decided they wanted the collar on the dog and so i needed to put the rope and the sea glass in so i painted that with um absorbent ground and then i went over it with my watercolor so it brought basically brought me back the white of the paper because if i tried to paint that on top of the kind of the black tones that i have here it would have just made mud so that's what i tend to use it for but i've also painted like a little gift tin and i've painted blue and i have a tutorial of this on my channel and i painted blueberries on it every time i get off my chair it like pops up high in the air so i I'm going to fill my chair here. Um, so that's, but, but there's a lot of uses for it. It just, it seems to be a little bit lighter when I paint on top of it than regular paper. Okay. I'm just going to see what I missed here. Um, 
Uh, do you go over the brushes? Uh, can I go over the brushes I used today? Yes, I didn't use many. I used, um, to keep it loose, we started off with a three quarter inch flat and we did our wash and we did quite a bit of painting with this actually. Then I used a number eight round and these are both mimic synthetic squirrels. So they act like a really absorbent soppy fur brush, but they're, but they're synthetic. Then for regular synthetics, I have a half inch Royal Majestic angled. And then I just used this um, kid's brush. This is a Fab Art number four flat. So um, yeah, nothing too fancy. Uh, oh, it does kind of look like Chewy, but that's actually a Newfoundland dog. And Chewy is kind of like, a, I think a golden retriever, a black uh, or German Shepherd mix. Um, okay, so I think what I'm going to do is grab the pastels. So those of you that wanted to see the pastel here, we'll do that now. And I will make a note in the video description that we actually jumped around a little bit in case anybody is. Sometimes people complain about me answering questions on live streams, but that's what I do the live streams for. So I can have a little bit of um, interaction and make sure that you guys are kind of understanding and everything. Caitlin uh, <laughs> likes the cobalt teal. Yeah, I would definitely would recommend picking up some of that if you like that. All right, that's that's dry and that's pretty dry. It feels a little cool, but I'm going over it with dry media, so I'm not too worried about it. I think I'm actually going to charge right in with um, with my white highlights so I can get that get those in there. And what I'm going to do is be very decisive, but not put a ton down. I'm going to plant my pastel in and just give it a just give it a cut. I want to get a little angle there and I can soften it with my finger. I got a little crooked on that line, so I'm just kind of pulling it down to try to straighten it a little bit. And I'll then do a little bit of a spot. And I think I'll turn it a little bit so maybe I can get the edge a little bit. Just want to give it a little bit of a highlight where it meets the table. And maybe a little glint on the corner. Really want to thank the mods for coming out at last minute and helping me um, because I know that I missed a lot of comments and questions. That's just that crooked highlight is bugging me. But we have more light over here, so I just want to, and I want to have that darker highlight on the side anyway. Okay, and now I think I'll also just kind of hit a few of these. These uh, flowers with a little bit. Remember, I don't want to cover up all that salt that I did. See, when I don't start with much of a plan, I go to mixed media. Joey, uh, Joe was talking in chat about mixed media before we got going. And... Um, I was thinking, I was kind of thinking to myself, yeah, I do mixed media when I really mess up my watercolors. <laughs> it's so true. That's what happens. I uh, Usually if I'm doing a mixed media, it's because something's going terribly wrong. <laughs> or I'm just playing, you know, I'm just feeling very free and, and playing because I feel like I can be a little looser and more abstract. All right, what else do we have here for gorgeous color? Oh, maybe we can we'll try a little of this in the vase, too. I don't want to get too fussy with the vase because it is glass. I want it to retain its luminous quality, but it's hard to resist a pretty box of pastels. Get a little bit of this kind of mauve color. Try not to go overboard just because we have such pretty salty techniques in there. This is kind of an electric like neon mauve color so i like the life that it gives it but you got to be careful not to go too crazy with it get this darker violet it's kind of like just making accents i really need a bouquet of lilacs that i can really observe um let's see i don't have any really good soft blues in this that's kind of more of a gray i think hmm i wonder i'm just looking at my my pastels i have here i don't really have any really pale blues 
maybe this really I could use this really pale lilac I think yeah that'll work on some of these these more blue ones lavender it's like, like a gray lavender color so I just because I want to keep some things kind of cooler and some things warmer all right I, think I could do a little bit of a highlight on the uh, on some of our leaves like if you had uh, veins that were a little too strong you could go in with this I do like to give a little streak of color in the vase too, especially if I got a little highlight a little too. Now I'm really loving the layers of the pastel. I have to be honest. I think that's kind of cool looking. Okay, what do we need, guys? You want to give any suggestions? I feel like the table might need a little bit of a uh, of darkness. Let's see. Uh, Bonnie asked, could you use the soft pastels instead of the oil ones? These are soft pastels. These are chalk like a chalk pastel. Um, you could use oil pastels. It's completely up to you. I think the chalk, like the chalk, they each have their own benefits. Chalk will tend to smudge a little bit easier. Oil pastels, I don't know with the oil if it might have eventually damaged the paper. Could you do something with the violet blob on the lower right side? Violet blob, lower right side. Do you mean like that right there? I'm using this dark brown to just kind of give it a shadow and define it from the table. And I might use a little bit of that, that same color in the stem here. Define, I can define my stems a little bit. Now, another cool thing about any pretty much any chalk pastel you're going to work with is that it will be reactive with water. So I can, but you want to put a fairly stiff brush. I can go in and i can kind of paint with it and pull it out a little bit and it would make your lighter colors almost disappear too so if you got a little crazy then you could you could go in with a with a brush and kind of soften it and i could pull some of this color over into these stems And I could go and soften if I got too crazy on anything. I could soften it a little bit. It will dry a little bit lighter. So just keep that in mind. So this looks probably pretty dark right now, but it, it will be a little bit lighter. I feel like maybe I will. Somebody mentioned do something with the table. The table could be a little bit darker. That's my burnt sienna uh, indithrone blue mix. Throw some of that in there. Dry brushing a little bit because I'm using this that synthetic. It's not going to hold that much water. So I can get a more textured dry brush. I can go over that blob that somebody found offensive. <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's better. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sandra. All right. Because I think it looks kind of cool when you do have something kind of chaotic, but then you bring in a little bit of detail. It helps. We're crooked there on the screen. It kind of helps pull things together, I think. All right, and if anything looked a little too bold in the flowers, you can just kind of go and tap at it with a damp brush. All right, guys, I think that just about does it. I will see if there's any other questions in the chat. So if you have any, go ahead and uh, pop them in there. If I missed your question, go ahead and put them in now because I probably will be able to scroll back and find it on the fly. So um, I will get through as many questions as I can. Uh, wow, this has been a much longer stream than I expected. Um, it's 1 a.m. in the UK. We're hardcore. I watched the, tra the tractor earlier, too. Wow. Uh, that was Echel Fucking. <laughs> Um, Lindsay Johnson, I would just like to say this time slot for the live show is better for me on the West Coast rather than your usual Friday time. I'm glad that worked out for you. Thank you. Um, question, do you need to use a fixative now? If so, will it change the watercolor? Um, there's not a ton of pastel on there. I probably wouldn't bother with a fixative or maybe just a very light coat of um, like Krylon fixative. But um, 
you know, if you're not going to put it behind a mat and glass, you probably do want just a little light spray of something. Um, it might, the only thing that would darken would be your white pastel. Question, what tools do you recommend for using pan pastels that won't crumble into pieces? I like um, make, sponge tip makeup applicators and the soft tools that they sell for pan pastel. They last probably better than any making makeup applicators. And I'm looking for the word question in all caps. As the chat goes down quickly, I can miss the questions really easily. And, oh, a lot of nice thank yous. I do appreciate that. Amanda wonders, would I call this mixed media since adding the pastel? Um, yes, this would be considered mixed media. Uh, all right. I don't see any other questions. So I do want to thank everyone for hanging out. And I will go ahead and put, oh, we did have one more question. Uh, can you do a collab with Steve Mind of Watercolor, Marty Owens Art, please? Oh, that would be fun. Um, well, I can't speak for them, but I can ask them. We're all in a Facebook group together where we just kind of chat about, you know, YouTube stuff. So um, I can give them, I can ask them. We've done a Q&A before. Um, it's on my channel somewhere. And that was a lot of fun. Um question oh that's Val just saying how to ask questions awesome Val um I absolutely love the painting says Shauna and now I need them on my table I know I need to ask around if anyone will mind if I cut some lilacs out of their out of their their yard okay all right well thank you all for joining us today I it was so nice to see everybody and I will put the links in full description, full um, list of everything I ended up using in the video description. And um, and I'll look and do it. And thank you for watching. Got a couple more questions here. Can you use watered down acrylic for watercolor? You can, but you can't lift it back up. Um, question: Can you use gouache instead of using the messy pastels? Yes, you can. Sometimes gouache will the undercolors will bleed through, but um, other than that, it's fine. Um, thank you, Nancy Lynn. She says I'm the best. I do appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> Michael asks if you can have my painting. I actually sell my live paintings for $50. Anybody can email me if they're interested. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful time painting. I hope you give this a try. And until next time, happy crafting.